Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. I think what's interesting about the list that you put up here is also in the differences. They don't really all have the same mission. Many of them are going to end up working together to solve the overall mm. problem. They have different uh, focuses and, and what have you. So I think what you've shown is kind of a representative sample of the way different organizations are approaching standardization and and getting together to, to create common benefit for IoT. There's a symbiotic relationship between standards organizations like the IETF and the IEEE and the nonprofit IoT alliances, groups, and consortia. The IoT industry needs standards, and the standards organizations need the IoT consortia to focus them on real world use cases and then carry on with testing, certification, and marketing. The gray zone is when the consortia get into the standards game. While there's value in making air quotes standards of standards, it can also be detrimental to industry when they're not made open to the public. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. If you guys are like me, the proliferation of all the different standards bodies, I don't know if I should group them in with the alliances, with the consortiums, and with the groups, is a little bit confusing. My name is Bruce Sinclair. I'll be the moderator of this panel. And if you could maybe just first introduce yourselves, and then we'll get into uh, just talking about what's up with, with all these uh, different organizations. Okay, I'm Michael Koster. I'm with ARM, and uh, I work on Internet of Things standards and architectures at ARM. I'm involved in both the uh, IETF and uh, the EBSO Alliance uh, Smart Objects uh, Committee. Uh, my name is Amin Chigani. I am uh, with GE. Uh, I am a solution architect uh, developing internet, in, industrial internet solutions for the different businesses within GE. I'm also a, uh, one of the founding members of the Industrial Internet Consortium, so I'll, I'll probably be speaking to that. My name is Michael Richardson. Um, I have a company, Sandelman Software Works. Um, I'm a consultant. Um, and I have been involved in the ITF for about 20 years, um, and I don't know very many of these alliances and groups myself. Carsten Bormann, also having been involved with the ITF for uh, 20 years. I'm with the uh, Universität Bremen in uh, Germany and have been working on various internet-related uh, technologies. And um, I have uh, been chairing the Sixth Law Pan Working Group until it was replaced by the Sixth Law Working Group and right now I'm co-chair of the Core Working Group working on application standards for the Internet of Things. Well, great. I'd like to start with, I mean, the ones that we've identified are, and maybe there's some missing ones, and so you, you guys can kind of fill it in, but it seems, you know, there are a lot of, obviously, organizations that are targeted around the Internet of Things, but these ones are more networking-focused. And so the ones we're talking about are the IPSO Alliance, the Industrial Internet Consortium, the All Seen Alliance, uh, the Thread Group, and then the Open Inter Interconnect Consortium. They seem to be the ones, I don't know, the flavors of, of today that seem to be most focused on networking. First of all, before we go any further, are there any other ones? <laughs> I don't think there needs to be any other ones, but are there any that are missing out of this list here that people should be looking at? Or is this pretty much it? Uh, I said Zigbee. The other organizations that are standards bodies, but the way that they operate at times, I think of them as more as private consortiums. Okay, I'm thinking about IEC, for instance, the electrical people. Mm -hmm. They 
are my experience are so close like it's easier to get information about what Zigbee's doing than well, what they're doing um, or their processes are so complicated and, and Byzantine that by the time they anyway well you can't see their document without being a member and then when you pay the money sometimes you still don't get the document or you don't get the document you want it and you're like this is the real those six years of effort <laughs> and it looks like you guys went wrong about five years and eleven months ago and so what what can we do I mean it can't help you right so they're like oh we really need to make this work and it's a you know it's an XML router over IPv4 like that's that's seriously one of the things that was proposed in Smart Grid. And it went a long way, and I don't know if it's dead yet. Okay, I'm not sure. So there's some road potential roadkill out there, but there in, are there any other more relevant ones uh, to today that, that we're missing on the list? That's probably worth mentioning that the Bluetooth SIG now has an IP working group. Huh. So it's it's quite likely that, that the purveyors of the various uh, radio technologies uh, will look at this in, in various detail, uh, various levels of detail. Okay. And the Wi-Fi uh, forum. Um, has the same thing, I think, I've just learned. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, you know, there are other standards bodies. IEEE is working yeah. on IoT standards and all that. But I think what's interesting about the list that you put up here is also in the differences. They don't really all have the same mission. Many of them are going to end up working together to solve the overall hmm. problem. They have different uh, focuses and, and what have you. So I think what you've shown is kind of a representative sample of the way different organizations are approaching standardization and and getting together to, to create common uh, common benefit for an IOT well that's a good that's a good segue and 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 maybe you can start but 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 what is the, the missions the overlap of the missions that I think that's the first thing it's trying to untangle untangle what they do and and how they're different can you maybe uh, talk to the industrial uh, and I think wise? this this could be a good example to 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 um, give a, a, a clear distinction between a standards body and other organizations such as the industrial internet consortium what the industrial internet consortium is not it's right. not a standards it's organization. not a standard okay. so and I think I think lumping those together I think for the audience we're talking about a group of, 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 of uh, stakeholders coming together. I think there is a standards organization to standardize on a particular technology versus a consortium that's trying to, for the industrial internet, for example, is trying to take advantage of a white space called the industrial internet and monetize on it. So the industrial internet uh, main main uh, mission is to identify, define this this white space that we call the industrial internet that's mm -hmm. been untapped. It's a thirty-two trillion dollar market opportunity, and uh, no one company uh, can actually define and and, and realize this this uh, uh, this market opportunity. So there is a clear uh, understanding that. From the big uh, companies, you have the IBM, GE, Intel, Cisco, uh, to uh, the small players, all have a, uh, I think, a single interest of identifying the space, identifying the gaps, and then competing with services and products to monetize on that. So I think that is different from. So not creating standards, but maybe. Uh, nominating or supporting standards? Would that be the difference? It is influencing standards, okay. evaluating current standards, okay. uh, whether they meet, uh, I, I think, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the challenges of, of the industrial internet space. Uh, um, so, for example, the industrial internet has formalized relationships with uh, organization, uh, organizations such, such as the OMG, the Open Group, Eclipse, uh, Oasis, and, and many others. And mm. the concept is as we get to define the space, we're going to evaluate, we're going to look at existing technologies and okay. standards, identify the gaps, utilize what we already have and build on top of it. So you could see uh, a group that really focused on uh, standardizing and a group that is focused on making money of those standards. So, so um, I didn't know about the Industrial Internet Consortium until I met you this morning and I read the web pages and I, it looks really, really cool. And I think that's a really good thing. And I want to say that one of the problems that ITF working groups have is that we we get uh, a set of requirements, usually from you know the people that are involved. And frequently, the scope of the work, if you know you kind of leave us to ourselves, will will do one of two things. It'll either become so broad and so so you know all inclusive and 
happy granola kind of thing, you know, that uh, effectively we've said nothing about anything, right? We've made a standard that says you can do whatever you want whenever you like, and that's great, okay? And everyone's happy, okay? Well, that's not a standard. And an all-inclusive standard. It's an all-inclusive standard. And we, we've done this on occasion, and some of the worst situations for this has been X500, X509, PKIX, the sole certificate stuff, you know, so inclusive and, and broad and, and yet has so many problems over 25 years, you know, uh, but nobody, nobody dares to throw it out. Um, so just to make an example, right, we have X500, which is, you know, a directory system that's from like 30 years ago and has no ability to name machines, right? It names people, John Smith. It doesn't even know how to, to distinguish all the John Smiths in the world, okay? What a useless piece, <laughs> okay? So, so, you know, we have X509 that says how to, how to sign these things, right, assuming you had the right John Smith, and then we had a working group in the IETF called PKICS, which ran for t- almost 20 years, um, and, you know, which said, well, a little bit more how to precisely use this stuff. Well, in the IPsec space, we had to make a working group called PKI for IPsec, which said exactly how to put these things in VPN gateways. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous, right? Well, we are going to have to have uh, a working group in the IETF or somewhere else that says PKI for IoT. We're going to have to do that. I, we're not going to get to throw out this technology. I'm, I, it's sad, but it's, it's true. Maybe Jose will be the new format, but we're still going to have to be able to translate back and forth between the other things. That would be wonderful. The point I'm trying to make here is, though, the other side that happens is we build something which is so specific that it addresses one person or one vendor's need, and that's it, and no one else can innovate. And then what we see is, well, I didn't really like that one, so I made my own, Right. So we wind up with a proliferation of different standards rather than a good one. So the question is, what's in between? And to get that real you know, piece out of there, what we need is people who are actually using it and deploying it, not vendors of hardware that hope to sell into that market, but the people they're selling to, we call them operators, to come to the ITF and say, no, it's not going to work for me. So in one working group, that is right up your alley, and I, I'm going to talk later about that, um, you know, we want to know to what extent certificates and certificate management is something that is going to fly in industrial areas, right? And so I think this is a wonderful thing, and if this is where it's going to go, wow, what, a, what an opportunity to really get this right and get it right quickly. And that's, I think, really important about this. Okay. So j- just to add to this, I completely agree with what, what Michael just said. Um, another group that uh, has been very instrumental in keeping us honest in, in the IETF uh, is the open source community because they also are using what, what we are doing and, and can quickly tell us what works and what doesn't work. What the open source community does not always give us is, is a good sense of what's actually needed. Uh, so that's really where, where consortia can be helpful in, in selecting technology that, that works together in a, in a good way. Hmm. I think it's helpful for the audience to describe a little bit how the, the IIC is structured. I think there are three focus areas. Uh, just to, to add to what Michael said, the first one is what we call the, um, the IIC ecosystem, which is this private-public partnerships that needs to exist to, to, to drive and innovate in the space of the industrial internet. The second one is the, the technology, the, the working groups, and we have two major working groups, the technology group, uh, under which there are many teams, mm-hmm. and the security group, under which there are uh, many teams, and that speaks to, to, to what you said. But still, that's not enough. Mm-hmm. The final focus area is the test beds, and right. that's where the example of the open source, you saying of trying with things, test beds are about taking these understandings of the gaps of the technologies and then having member companies saying, I raise my hand, I'm going to build this test bed and I'm going to show how it works and how I'm going to show how it, I can make money out of it. Uh, and that is something that can be brought back to, to, to uh, the technology group uh, to uh, revisit some of the, some of the uh, analyses that they've done on standards or the architectures or the um, security frameworks and also goes back all the way to the ecosystem right. uh, for, for evaluation and adoption. So I think, uh, I think the consortium has thought about 
all of these, and I think the test beds are the key, I think, differentiators that we're going to have companies spending money. And if you go to the website, you'll see uh, uh, members have put in a lot of uh, money in, in demonstrating some of the pieces of the industrial internet. Uh, uh, and, and of course, if you're a pioneer, then you get to uh, you know, benefit from the first market slice first, of the, of, of the uh, market opportunity. So. Yeah. Michael, can you talk to IPSO a little bit, and, and how does it how does it fit into yeah, yeah IPSO Alliance. Um, so um, again, we're we're looking at what are the gaps. Uh, IPSO Alliance was formed to basically promote IP protocols for smart objects. Of, of That's any, IPSO. So yep. Very broad mission. Uh, we basically just want to see things connected using IP protocols. So we want an Internet of Things. Um, that extends a little bit to web protocols because that's been so successful as well. So that, that's the broad mission of the IPSO Alliance. We've recently uh, been doing some work that we call Smart Objects, which is to basically take some existing protocols that are already built on top of IP, mm. uh, particularly the COAP protocol and, uh, and IETF protocols from the core working group, and uh, another organization, the Open Man uh, o OMA, Open Mobile Alliance, right. which has their lightweight M2M uh, management specification. And then we're building a set of uh, a data models for devices and application level uh, um, things like thermostats, temperature sensors, things of that nature, to to function as sort of a primitive sort of, sort of data model primitives for doing interoperability. Mm -hmm. So we're just looking at the, the upper layers of the stack and building on other technology that that already exists um, in in the IP world. So IP based technology. A couple of other of these I, I could mention a little bit about too, sure. as, as people were talking and how different gaps are being addressed. So one of the things that a couple of these alliances are looking at is certification. So whose IETF basically creates uh, protocols and building blocks to make system architectures out of, but there's no real way to say, well, how do I know when I go buy this, it's going to work with mm -hmm. this, or if I, if I sign up with a software contractor that all my devices are going to work together. And that's something that at one level, Thread Group might be able to do uh, the, the lower levels of the IP stack that run on wireless networks. And uh, a, a group like Open Internet Consortium might be able to st take existing standards and just specify how they go together to make a, a, a complete end-to-end -end system. This is what the OMA does, for example. Mm. They take COAP and they take a number of IETF protocols and they specify how you use those protocols to build a, a server. But what we need is, of course, a, a much broader, a broader thing than that. Mm. For me, what's the role of, you know, I didn't say standards here. It was more, you know, alliances, consortiums, and, and groups. But it seems like there's a partnership, and it's come out in the conversation so far in the sense that we've got standard bodies, but they need to rely on industry to make sure what they're standardizing is relevant. And then you've got the, bo and then you've got the, the alliances, the groups, and the consortiums who can fill in the gaps where maybe they're doing the certification, maybe they're doing the testing, maybe they're getting the requirements from um, the real world. And that seems like a partnership. But then I guess where it kind of falls down is when some of these start trying to become standardized, standardization bodies because then it seems like it breaks that model because it's not an open standardization process, it's kind of a standardization process within the members of the group. Um, is that a fair characterization? Y yes, and it's extremely frustrating as an open source developer. Um, it's extremely frustrating to sit down and go, well, how do I implement this? And then discover that you're not actually sure what it, what it is because, you know, you often can't read the documents. One of the most frustrating things is, is a number of, of alliances and consortiums and this kind of stuff don't even have a stable URL for their document. Okay, you have to log into their website and go here and go there. When you look at the top of the URL, it hasn't changed because they have some CMS that, that is all, you know, browser state based. So I can't even say to Karsten, here's the document, it's over here. You want to read paragraph 12, right? That's the problem, right? So I can't even ref talk about it intelligently, even if we're both members, let alone, you know, we're not members. Um, and that's a, that's a real, it's a real, real, real problem. Standards which open source developers cannot read for free, okay? Free means, mean, means not just free beer, but free speech, okay? So if, you can't, if I can't put a copy on my laptop and work at it at the cottage, then 
well, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to get built, and you won't have that st stuff out there. Um, but there's another side, which is a legal side, and the IETF ha is, is, is getting challenged recently um, in some places as to not all countries consider the IETF standards to be, to be a standards development organization. So there are countries for which IETF standards are not allowed to be mentioned. <laughs> okay? Um, now, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and I'm not going to speak about all the other ones that have happened recently, um, is very specific, and, and, and a group I'm part of in Ottawa actually deals with this, where we, we're called, we have two names, we're called Getting Open Source uh, into Government, but we also realize that's Getting Open Standards Logic into Government. It's Gosling. It's a good, good acronym. Um, anyway, but one of the key things is that one of the things that governments can't do, and in most cases that goes down all the way municipalities and anybody who's supported that way, is they can't buy things for which there's not a performance specification. So they're not allowed to go out and buy a copy of Microsoft Word. That is a brand. The best they can say is, I have Microsoft Word or equivalent. Well, really, now what they can say is, I need an editor that supports OOXML format. That's what they're supposed to say. And so it's really important if you want, if you do do a profile of, you know, that says, use A and B and C and, and 6 low and this and that and GCH and GHC, I'm sorry. Um, if you're saying, I want to do all these things, it's actually really important to have a document that goes through a standards organization that says, here is the single document that specifies for the application of uh, dishwashers, okay, that these are the things that I expect to have in the dishwasher. Because once you do that, it now becomes possible for people that want to buy your stuff to actually specify it, right? And that's a really big deal. Otherwise, you're not selling to governments. And if you're not selling to governments, then I suspect you're probably not in business, right? Traditionally, technology standardizers, tra technology alliances have left the user experience as a market differentiation mechanism to, to the individual vendors. But that doesn't work in this space. In particular, security th that has uh, a user experience that, that is different between different systems that we want to uh, connect just doesn't work. If people who, who know how to operate system A suddenly make serious security mistakes when operating system B because the user experience is different, different uh, we have created an insecure uh, Internet of Things. So that, that's maybe a new thing for, for the consortia to look at, uh, making sure that we actually have user experiences that still provides some market differentiation uh, potential, of course, but that, that actually uh, standardize the core things. Uh, obviously, if you would, sell, would be selling a car that had the, the gas uh, pedal on, on the left, that wouldn't work too well. And we are lo selling lots of uh, internet devices with gas pedals on the left. Well, we're doing it worse, actually. We're selling cars that need different, uh, different kinds of gas. Right, that we're that we're not even at the point of standardizing the controls. They take different fuel, um, but I, I I I think this is a very important question, and I don't think it's going to get uh, better soon. I think it's going to get significantly worse. Um, I think that there will be a new um, back to the land movement to get away from all this 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 you know siloed stuff. Um, there will be. Uh, people who can't sell their houses because it's got the wrong technology built in. Um, and my take on all this is is pretty much what... Um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but he's been recently said this. Basically, he said that, that IoT devices either must, must be field upgradable or must have an end of life. Okay? So in a year, they turn off. Not 10 years. A year. And that's because... If you can't field upgrade them to fix the bugs, then you better turn them off. And that's going to be really wasteful. And I realized, of course, turning off may mean I can return it to the factory where it will get reflashed and sent back to me. So maybe it's not quite so e-wasteful as, as I thought it would be. But the reality is there's going to be an awful lot of devices that are going to go in the garbage because they cannot or won't implement the things that matter. And so my take on it is that the consumers are painfully going to become aware. They're going to start asking specifically, you know, does this run an open standard? And if the answer is no, then they're going to say, 
I'm sorry, I don't care if it's 10% cheaper. I will have to get a new one. And we just need to get to that standard, I guess. Yeah, there's a lot of will out there to do that. And Comcast, two people from Comcast stood up at the IEEE public workshop on P2413 and said, the next Xfinity system will be open to developers and open to many people to contribute. So they're not just going to go you know, back to iControl and have them spin their proprietary stuff one more time. They want to open up. All of the operators and, and service providers are saying, look, we're, we're seeing the pressure now, so we, we want to get together and, and do standards. And that's where things like Open Internet uh, Interconnect Consortium come from. And we're building the stuff now. So imagine Thread Group comes up with, and the intention there is for a more, you know, an open, open standard for everyone to be able to use as well. Uh, comes up with a way to connect low power radio so anything will use a single access point for low power radio and um, you know open internet consortium is already looking at using co-op and IETF protocols and and these these standards so um, if a number of if there's critical mass in the industry around these standards which there seems to be the will for then then things are already moving in this in this direction we need to uh, just keep keep it going I just want to look at it from let's let now let let's kind of look at it from the business perspective. Um, so I'm a business, and why are these alliances, consortiums, or groups relevant? So how do I take advantage of these organizations for my business? What what do I do? How do I interact? Why do I care? So I think uh, the example of the Industrial Internet Consortium. I think some of the benefits include. Um, having exposure to more than 95 uh, members across 22 countries, okay. all in the industrial internet space. Um, so I think it could, Steve could, could be part of the consortium. Both uh, contributes to, to defining what the industrial internet is, as well as sell its product. Okay. Uh, so I think that would be one, one, one clear. I think two is uh, companies are being literally forced into um, revol revolutionizing how to do business in the industrial internet space. And it's until you can define this space, uh, you can't think of new business models, what you can, or what are you gonna change to? And I think one of the, one of the speakers earlier, you challenged him into, we don't even know what the internet of things uh, is. And I think unless you define that very clearly, you define how what that market opportunity is and how you go about it. Mm. It's very difficult to compete. So, so I think the benefit is is I think it goes without mention is uh, uh, everybody wants to 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 take a piece of this market opportunity and it's uh, until you come to a, a group of like-minded uh, I, I think um, uh, uh, company you define what that is and then then the competition starts. So it's a great club to be part of. Yes. So. Of course, th there are other motivations uh, you might have for uh, entering a consortium. For instance, the Bluetooth SIG um, really is interesting because it uh, provides an IPR pool uh, so that the members of the Bluetooth uh, SIG uh, don't necessarily have problems, at least with the other members of the Bluetooth uh, SIG, of course, you never know when you run into a patent booby trap. Um, and um, th that is very useful for them, but on the other hand, it, it creates a problem because as long as the specification is, is in the making, it's not possible for people outside the, the consortium to actually see what's going on and, and to provide uh, input. So um, th this has a positive side and, and a negative uh, side. Um, some consortia are obviously being created uh, w with the, the um, idea that the main motivation to, to go in there is to gain influence on, on what the outcome will be. So they will be even more uh, limited in, in what input they actually allow from, from the outside. And that generally creates quality problems because you, you really have to have uh, some form of, of open uh, uh, input uh, to a standardization uh, activity. So that, that doesn't really uh, work uh, very well. Um, and other consortia are built around a, a kernel of, of uh, intellectual property. 
uh, for instance, the, the Altin Alliance was founded based on a, a software dump that, that um, Qualcomm made. So they, they had this project and, and this generated about a quarter million lines of code and they didn't quite know what to do with it. So uh, they decided to, to open source it, but also build a consortium about it. And that, that's a rather interesting uh, thing. Uh, well, open source is, is something that, that uh, first of all, uh, is very good. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they, they are trying to uh, create a security standard for, for a certain area of the Internet of Things. And um, you don't normally create a security standard by dumping, dumping a quarter million lines of code at people and uh, not having a specification of what's uh, in there because security documents need much, much more analysis uh, even th than uh, uh, other documents. So open source alone also isn't quite uh, uh, enough. You actually have to have an open uh, process that allows uh, input from, from many, many uh, sides. And there's actually an, an organization now that has been created to uh, connect those standards bodies who are um, uh, operating under these open standards uh, principles, and that includes, for instance, the IETF, but also IEEE, which is a little bit further away from, from these principles, but still has a very open way uh, for people to participate. Sometimes infuriating that you can't get at the documents, uh, but uh, still uh, for a pretty nominal uh, uh, charge, you, you can actually participate and, and influence what's going on. And other organizations like the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, also uh, work based on, on this model of operation. And I think in the Internet of Things, we are going to see much more weight to standards which have been built based on this model of, of generating quality specifications. So I think Tim O'Reilly said, um, uh, he said that uh, create more value than you capture when you're in various ecosystems. And I think the IoT space is a space where you really, ha th this, is, this is really, really very true. As soon as you open your device up to talking to devices that you haven't thought of, you have created uh, two things. You've created first a new company. Someone else has got something that's talking to yours. But of course, they have to have one of yours to talk to. So they're now out doing your work for you. And so that's a case of, of you've opened up, you've created some value, but you haven't captured it all. You've left it for the other things. Um, historically, people were, were marveled, of course, that Microsoft created huge, huge, you know, uh, opportunities. Sometimes they were sad about them because it was in the form of, you know, virus scanners and other things like this. And, but in general, it was a huge ecosystem that just got created and, you know, we're living in the middle of it and it's still there. Um, and that's really, really important. Apple figured this out with all the cases for their, their, their phones, right? It was a huge ecosystem. They won't let you put stuff in the phones, but you can put stuff around them, and there's a huge ecosystem of that. And so I think this is the, this is the case for this. So even, even if you have an, uh, an, in, an, a, an IoT alliance whose only purpose it is to standardize the power connector or the recharge connector, right? Wow, that's, that's, that's still creating a thing. We have it. It's micro USB, so we don't have to do that. But... But the point is that still it's created a huge ecosystem of useful stuff. And that's why I think you come to a, a, a something like this is, is for that. All right. Well, I think um, uh, with that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll leave it. Thank you, uh, panelists. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. Okay. That was an informative panel discussion. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. 
Or, if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And, of course, you can support the show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is IoT Standards. What do you mean? With me. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next week, may your path to IoT business be a symbiotic one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 